Good morning and welcome to Orkney International Science Festival 2021 online in this year of Scotland's coasts and waters. My name is Eric Walker and it's my pleasure to be hosting this session. Our speakers today are Len Wilson and Dennis Davidson, who come from a long line of Gremsey seafarers, some of whom moved to Stromness, where both Len and Dennis grew up. Dennis went to, to south to Glasgow to train as a naval architect and joined the company McGrewers as a designer and later technical director. He dealt with the design and construction of cold moulded racing yachts and traditional sailing and motor yachts. For the past 30 years, he has worked at Murray Cormac Associates, where he designs pilot and harbour boats and small ferries. Len joined the Merchant Navy and spent a few years sailing the oceans of the world. He followed this with a couple of years building boats before settling into a career as an air traffic engineer, looking after aeronautical systems and communication. He subsequently served as engineering manager at Kirkwall and Wick airports. Today, we look at all types of fast sailing ships, with naval architect Dennis Davidson examining the physics of sail power and former boat builder Len Wilson looking into the story of the ships themselves and their sailing rigs. I want to encourage you all to take part in this event and ask you please enter your comments and questions in YouTube's live chat and I'll present them to the speakers after their talks. Len and Dennis, over to you. Hello. Uh, I'm starting here with uh, a wee quotation from John Masefield to see on the screen there. I'm not a literary man, but I do share his uh, a little bit of life at sea. He was sailed in a more romantic time than me, of course. Uh, he was on sailing ships and his first voyage took him round the horn on a four-masted bark. And uh, he wrote a diary, which makes interesting reading. And I noted from that that I also shared the three desperate days of seasickness. <laughs> anyway, that's all behind. Uh, and we're going to the ships now for, for hundreds of years now. Ocean trade was driven by the power of the wind. And uh, but early ship design for cargo, carrying cargo, speed wasn't of the essence, really. They wanted to get as, as much cargo into the vessels as possible. Consequently, you see, this is the replica of uh, Cook's Endeavour. So you're looking at uh, a ship from the 1700s, and, and you see, see the bow, it's just almost square pushes an awful lot of water ahead, a slow ship. This is uh, a picture of the replica, and you can see there quite a lot of white water pushed ahead uh, and pulled us down. And this one, this aerial picture really shows just a wall of water across her bows. And they said the maximum speed was seven knots, and they surprisingly even made that. The, of course, there was a fast development <laughs> to move on to the, the real workhorses of the 19th century, the clippers. And uh, it was the Chinese tea trade, really, that uh, drove design, but it was kick-started by the Americans. They had a fast clipper called the Orient, and she had made a couple of very impressive trips from China via Cape Horn to New York. Interesting to note that it was deemed easier to go around Cape Horn than transport tea across America. Uh, she had made, uh, I think, 80-odd days to run to New York. So in 1855, they decided to challenge the London route. And uh, 
her reputation had gone before her, such, and it was such that her skipper was able to charge double the price for freight and still get a ship loaded first and away first. And she made London in 97 days. Uh, the British ship owners got a rude awakening and the gloves were off. Tea was a valuable seasonal crop and speedy delivery was essential to make good profits. Now, William Hall, the Aberdeen shipbuilder, had developed a very fast hull for the Aberdeen London service. And his Aberdeen bow, which you would have seen in that previous picture, the Aberdeen bow, was, was adopted for the new fast clippers. Uh, the most famous one, of course, was the Cutty Sack. And you see a picture here of her bow. You see how sleek and sharp it is and how streamlined she is. And ships like that, say, in a favourable wind, may easily make 17 knots and out sailing steamers of the time. The merchants paid a 10% premium for the first tea cargo home and the skipper and crew got a share, so the, so the annual tea race had started. The races uh, commanded the attention of the whole country, and crowds lined the English Channel coast to get a glimpse of the final dash. Uh, the most famous race, of course, was this one in 1866, when after 19 da 99 days of racing and if anybody Watching this uh, sailing in a regatta, they'll know how demanding it can be, even for a few hours, and about, let alone 99 days. Uh, this is the aerial in front, followed by the Taiping, in the race up the channel. The uh, aerial arrived at the Thames Pilot 20 minutes before <laughs> Taiping but typing at a shower draft, so she got into the dock first. So technically, she that made her the winner. However, the two skippers uh, decided that rather than make a controversy about it and maybe have the prize withdrawn, they would share the prize. So it was uh, Captain John Kay of the Ariel. He was from, uh, oh, there was a third, and a third ship was not too far behind them, actually. She arrived about an hour later, the Ceresa. Now, uh, Kay and the Ariel was, uh, for, and, and George Innes of the Ceresa, they were both from Anstruther, or I should say, if anybody from there is listening, Ensta, <laughs> Fife, and uh, Donald McKinnon of the Taiping was from Tyree. And all, all three ships were built on the Clyde. And in today's money, Kay and McKinnon shared about 2,000 quid. But I would guess their reputation was maybe more important to them because they became household names and they made them very hireable by other companies. Uh, in his book on the China Clippers, Basil Lubbock described it as a great day for the land of cakes. It was a very hazardous occupation, of course, and eventually, of the five ships that set off in the 1860 race, 1866 race, of the five of them, four eventually came to grief, either by running ashore or loss at sea. I'm going to move on now to say a little bit about sales and the sale development. And here we're looking at uh, early sailing vessel, Viking ship. And she's carrying a square sail, of which is symmetrical either side of the mast, absolutely rectangular. Great for running before the wind, but not very good at trying to struggle head to wind. The development from this was the dipping lug, and you can see it one here on the foremast is a dipping lug. It's just not quite square, and there's a little bit more sail aft of the mast than ahead of it. The tackle sail is attached to the bow, and uh, 
The disadvantage of this, of course, you didn't want to tack very often because when you tack, you had to transfer the seal to the other side of the mast, which meant lowering the yard, transfer the run, and hoist up the other side. A laborious but highly skilled job. The development from that was to go to what they called a standing lug, and you can see one on the mizzen mast. The standing in the standing lug, there's less sail ahead of the mast, and the tack of the mast is attached to the bottom of the mast. The, the tack of the sail attached to the bottom of the mast, so you don't have to lower the sail. And this illustration here shows a canoe, in fact, sailing with two standing lugs, and they just flop round as you tack. In ordinary, the North Isles Yoles preferred to use the, the standing lug, but uh, in the South Isles, it was the split sail. And, and this is a South Isles Yole. And yes, that's, that's me in the middle of the boat there with a white head. Uh, you see the split pushes the top of the sail up and it's attached to the bottom of the mast. The split on this, on the foresail, is behind the sail. But you can see the outline of it there. And uh, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, tacking with square riggers. And uh, I will mention this mainsail and the, and the yard arm, which the skipper will have to manipulate. I'll make, come back to that later. Uh, here we have a, a big, a big split sail. This is a Thames barge. Huge split sail, the split is iron, and it takes a winch to operate all that gear. And uh, they were heavily, heavily laden, taking cargoes up and down the Thames, and often uh, they were sailed just uh, as a, a man and a boy. You'll notice she has a small mizzen sail mounted in the stand. And that's not to give her propulsion, that's to aid with maneuvering and steering. And uh, you see a skipper standing there. And down here, the, the clue, the, the sheet from the clue of the sail is attached to the rudder. So when the skipper pushes his rudder over, the sail gets pulled with it. So it's, it's like a, it's a, an aid for, especially for tacking to push the stand on when you're tacking, but it's like an air rudder. You could look at it as that. A little bit about different types of rigs. Uh, there's too many to go into them all, but th this is a three-masted back and tin. Back and, and you can see she's got square sails, yards and square sails on the foremast only. And she has uh, uh, four and a half sails on the, the other two. Uh, a lot of them operate on the coast of different rigs, and the coast was uh, they were the, the the ocean was our main road really for carrying cargoes, and so they operate all around the coast and across the North Sea. Uh, this is a topsail schooner. Uh, this one belonged to uh, Alec Rousey of Stromness, and. Uh, you get a variety of topsail schooners. You can see he's has carrying two topsails on his foremast. Uh, here we have another strumless one, topsail schooner Maggie. And you see two square sails, topsails on the foremast. But they came in a variety of rigs. Uh, this one by sketch by Harold Underhill, and he's uh, a two masted two top sail schooner, and you'll see they've got top sails, square top sails on both masts. Uh, here we have a brig. Uh, she's she's a full rig ship, really, with two a two masted full rig ship. And you see square miles, square sails on the both masts, and a spanker on the aftermast. A brigantine, slightly different, fewer sails on this one. Uh, she doesn't carry square sails on the lower parts of the 
مثل ما Now we're getting into real business. A three masted ship. This was the clipper ship. The Greyhound of the Sea. I'm just catching up with my notes here to make sure I haven't missed anything else. The, and this was what developed to carry cargoes at, at speed around the world. A picture of a rather nice one, the Peru of Dundee. She's a sister ship called the Chile. They were known as the, the Dundee Twins. Uh, here we have uh, an iron ship later, later in the 19th century, the iron ship, the Coriolanus. She's uh, full rigged, as you can see. And uh, she was a uh, Known for being a speedy ship, uh, uh, my grandfather's uh, oldest brother, George Rich, he was he sailed on her as second mate, and he claimed that she had once touched 20 knots on his watch during a fierce squall, when he said she filled her decks over the forecastle head. And she was a strong ship. On one occasion, she sank, a, she collided with a steamer off the South Island, and the steamer sank. Uh, I think some people might dispute that she ever made 20 knots, but she was a fast ship. And now we see standardization creeping in. Uh, this is this is not a clipper, of course, this is a four-masted back. Now the, the back didn't carry square sails on our mizzen mast. And they came in uh, various, you get three-masted, four-masted, and even five-masted backs. Uh, but standardization, you see. Three masts are same height, and all the same sails are identical, so that they didn't have to carry so many spares. Uh, here we have a five-masted example, full rate, square sails on the mizzen as well. And this is the Prusen, the a German company, the P, P ships. They built several of them, but they never really became terribly popular because they needed a very large crew and they were difficult to maneuver, as you might imagine. For sailing vessels like that, uh, you had to use the sails to steer the ship as well, to, especially when tucking and wearing, which I'll come on to. And now I've dropped back a little. This is the three, because the back really became the workhorse of the 19th century. This is a three-masted bag. I think mainly there were four-masted bags, but, but a lot of tea clippers. When the Suez Canal opened, I think 1869, that finished the tea clipper trade because the steamers could go through the canal where it was the clipper couldn't. So a lot of clippers, they were still used, of course, but they reduced them to a three-masted back rig because they didn't need to carry so many crew. We did a little bit cheaper. Dangerous business. <laughs> and here we see a vessel sailing before the wind in a storm. Now, men wouldn't want to climb the mast under those conditions in norm normally, but it looks as though the clue of the sail here is has flipped out and just sails been in danger of being carried away with the wind. So there's four men up there, no safety harness, feet on the foot rope, one hand for the ship and one hand for the man. That was the rule. And there were there were many accidents, of course. You'll see down on deck the water is coming on board and water on the poop deck as well. And here is the poop deck. Two men at the wheel and officer of the watch. And you can see a big follow and see coming behind. Uh, and uh, that was a particular danger. As that came on board, the men needed to be lashed in, in their positions. Uh, and here we have sea breaking on board. And you can see on the board deck, there's Several men up on the boat deck look like they're securing the lifeboat. 
and the aftermath. Uh, the boat, de boat deck has been wrecked and uh, bulwarks still in and rope lying everywhere, a bit of damage here as well. Now, I'm going to do a little bit on the tacking and wearing ship on a square rigger. Now, oh, I'm aware that you're not all be sailors, so tacking is, tacking and wearing ship, that was to turn the ship so that the wind blows on the other side of the vessel. If you're trying to go to windward, you're, you're, you're travel for a, a distance on one tack, then you change over to the other tack. It's a tedious, a tedious job. And, and on a square rigger, tacking could only be done in light winds because the, the mass wouldn't stand high pressure on the back of the sails, on the fore side of the sails from the heavy wind. In the heavy wind, they, wear, they did the wearing, the wearing ship procedure, which meant turning the stern to the wind to turn the, turn the ship right round. Here we have an illustration that the wind is blowing from the south, up this direction, and uh, the vessel is on following this route and wants to follow tack onto the other route. So the procedure is that they come up to the wind. They don't have the power to steer right through the wind so that they would come to a stop. So they've got, when they get up to this position, they've got to start using the sails to turn the ship. She's up in this position now, and if they don't do something serious, they'll get stuck there. So what they've done, they've moved the yards round so that uh, the yards on the aftermast, the, the wind against the back of those sails is pushing the sail pushing the stern to the right, whilst this yard, the sail on this yard is pushing the bow to the left. That's the next part of the procedure. You see the two after mast, they're catching no wind, but the foremast is pushing the ship in that direction. They've got, they've got round, set, sail set for sailing and, and they're off. Now, wearing ship, the, the wind is blowing from the north in this, in this occasion, and you see she's going to sail round, turn her stern to the wind, and right round to sail off on the other tack. Again, using the sails to turn the ship. The, the main mast and uh, mizzen mast, you see they're set to, to, to minimize the wind effect, whereas the bow is still being blown round to the south. Still in that position, but you see just coming round. And in this position now, you see the, the after part of the ship has been pushed to the, to the right, whilst the fore mass is still pushing to the left. And there's a run and away on the other tack. And say, a skilled and sometimes very hazardous business, especially if it was done in heavy seas, and it sometimes happened. Um, uh, I've showed you with the diagrams, but now if, if any of you are interested in watching it really happen in real life, I would recommend that you go to YouTube and look for how to sail a full rig ship. And you'll see the whole procedure, which is quite complex. Um, I spoke about the, the hazards and dangers when wearing ship and this ship here had an unfortunate experience. This is, this is a, a dioramic uh, model of the Loch Torrid and the Loch Line. Now, uh, Captain Robbie Sutherland, uh, some of you might have known him, he was at the sea school in Stromness. He and an uncle was lost off the ship when they were wearing ship off the Cape of Good Hope. And uh, the, I think the story was they were carrying too much sail and, and uh, Robbie's uncle was on the wheel and he and the skipper 
and the sailmaker and the boy were all lost overboard. And the mate only, he was on the poop as well, and he only survived because he got it caught in the rigging. But I think the skipper and the mate had, had a little a bit of an argument before the procedure because the, the mate wanted to reduce sail and the skipper overruled him. It cost him his life. Uh, I would, oh, that, was, that was actually, they were on the jute trade. That was a trade from India to Dundee mainly, uh, carrying jute. And uh, my dad had an uncle on a similar ship, actually, the, uh, who was lost at sea, the, the county of Selkirk, which was a similar vessel, and she disappeared without trace in the Indian Ocean. Uh, now we've got modern, a high tech one. This is the, the Royal Clipper, and on this one, you'll notice the sails furled inside the spars. And there's an electric motor in each end. And at each mast, a man stands at the bottom of the mast with a, a keypad in one hand <laughs> and a walkie-talkie in the other to get his orders. And he controls the, the rigging, the set of the sails with one hand, one man in each mast. I, I was on this ship as a passenger and the... Uh, the skipper demonstrated tacking in light winds one morning. It was quite impressive. I, I note now that there is another one just been launched, just gone to sea this year, I think. She's also, she's a five-masted bark, I think. This one's a full rigger. And there she is under full sail. And now, back where we started. Now, this is a very impressive painting. I'm going to disillusion you though, because <laughs> she's carrying fair weather sails. She wouldn't survive in a sea like that with that sail rig. Uh, but it really makes an impressive picture and the painter obviously knew his ships and knew his sea. Uh, but uh, that brings me to an end. I'm going to introduce you now, introduce you now to uh, Dennis to carry on with his section on the science of it all. Dennis. The, <coughs> the square sail, sorry, can you go to the next slide please then? The square sail was used in Europe to propel boats from as early as the first century BC. The earliest evidence of sails being used in Scandinavia, however, dates from the 6th or 7th century AD and are carved images on the Gotlandic st picture stones. Next slide, please. The Osberg ship, which dates from 820 AD, is the earliest Viking ship found to date, with evidence of having stepped a mast and carried a sail. Next slide. The head of the square sail was usually laced or tied to a yard, which was secured at mid-length to the mast. Control lines called braces were secured to the yard ends and ropes called sheets were tied to the lower corners of the sail. The braces and sheets were adjusted to control the set of the sail. Next slide. On small vessels where the yard was raised and lowered using a halyard led over a sheave at the masthead, the yard was attached with a traveller or paddle, which allowed the yard to swing about the mast. So how does a sail propel a boat? Next slide, please. With the sail hoisted and the wind blowing directly from astern, the square sail is adjusted until the yard is at right angles to the wind. The sail fills and the boat begins to move in the direction of the wind. As the vessel picks up speed, the wind speed felt on the boat reduces and eventually this limits the speed that a sailing vessel can achieve sailing downwind. Aerodynamic research has shown that a cup-shaped object with the open end presented to the wind provides more resistance or drag than a flat plate of similar dimensions. Next slide please. 
The table in this slide compares drag factors for a selection of objects. In particular, a flat disk highlighted by the green arrow has a drag factor of 1.17, while an open cup shaped object as shown by the yellow arrow has a factor of 1.42. Thus a baggy old sail may be more efficient downwind than a new flat cut sail. Next slide please. This is why racing yachts often carry large sails called spinnakers to help propel them faster downwind. When sailing with the wind blowing from behind, a vessel is said to be running before the wind. Next slide, please. If the rudder is now turned so the vessel is sailing side on to the wind, and the braces and sheets are adjusted until the sail fills as shown in this slide, a baggy sail may still propel, propel the vessel forward, but greater heel angles will result than if a sail with less camber or curvature is set. Usually this direction of sailing produces the fastest vessel speeds, and lightweight high-speed yachts often tack or zigzag downwind rather than sailing directly before the wind, as this can allow them to reach their objective faster. This direction of sailing is usually referred to as broad reaching or reaching, depending on whether the sail is, so whether the wind is from the aft of a midships or from a beam. When reaching, the large forces generated by the sail in 15 or 20 knots of wind will cause the vessel to heel as well as move forward. So the hull needs to have sufficient stability to limit the heel angle and avoid water entering the hull over the gunnel. The hull also needs to have a means of resisting the side force to avoid sliding to leeward. Next slide, please. If the yard and sail are now trimmed until the square sail is set within the breadth of the vessel, and the yard and sail lie close to the shrouds and forestay, the vessel is said to be beating or tacking to windward. The forward lower corner of the sail or tack may be secured to the weather gunnel or to a bearing out spar as on the Viking Nar shown on this slide. If the helmsman turns the vessel's bow too close to the wind, the forward edge of the sail or luff will backwind and collapse. This direction of sailing is as close to the wind as the vessel can sail. A baggy sail is now a hindrance to progress and a sail with less belly or camber is needed. Greater side forces and sail tensions result from this direction of sailing. So stability combined with effective means of resisting the side force is necessary. On Viking ships and traditional sailing boats such as Yules, the long keel projecting below the, below the hull resists the side force when the helmsman steers a course slightly closer to the wind than the direction of travel. So the keel is at a small angle of yaw. On sailing yachts, the fin keel and rudder provide a more efficient means of resisting the side force. Next slide, please. The masters of square rigged ships often delayed sailing until the wind blew from a favorable direction for their intended voyage. This was one reason why the anchorages at Stromness and Long Hope were so popular in the 18th and 19th centuries, when ships attempting to sail west through the Pedland Firth against the prevailing winds before crossing the Atlantic or sailing down the west coast of Scotland. Bessie Milley in Stromness earned many a sixpence from anxious ship owners who requested she brew up a fair wind from the northeast. If we now consider how sails, sorry, how sailing vessels are able to sail into the wind. Next slide, please. This diagram shows a sailing yacht with a mainsail hoisted and beating towards the wind. Airflow streamlines are shown blowing towards the yacht from the left. You will see that the lines arch tightly over the back of the sail causing the wind speed to increase locally, while the streamlines flowing into the windward side of the sail are more widely spaced and slowed by the presence of the sail. As a result of the increased wind speed, the air pressure is lowered on the back of the sail near the mast, while higher pressures arise on the windward side where the wind is slowed. The pressure di distribution is shown in the next slide. Next slide, please.
The resulting aerodynamic force, Ft, is inclined slightly forward of a line drawn at right angles to the sail core, or breadth, and is similar to the force produced by an aircraft wing. Next slide, please. Here, the force is usually considered as being made up of a lift force at right angles to the airflow and a drag or resistance force in the direction of the wind. These forces increase in proportion to the square of the wind speed. In other words, if the wind speed doubles, the forces produced by the aerofoil are four times greater. And this is how aircraft are able to fly with their weight supported by the lift force produced by the wings. Next slide, please. This diagram shows how the forces acting on a sailboat beating to windward are resolved, with the sail force FT shown in yellow being balanced by the hull or keel force RT shown in blue, acting in the opposite direction. The driving force produced by the sails in the direction of travel, FR, is shown outlined in dotted red as 141 pounds or 64 kilograms. This is sufficient to allow the six meter yacht being considered to travel through the water at 5.9 knots while sailing at an angle of 39 degrees to the true wind. In other words, the yacht is able to sail towards the wind at an angle. Traditional cutter rig vessels and sailing yachts over the past 200 years have often been rigged with two or more sails supported on a single mast. The main mast, uh, sorry, the mainsail has its leading edge or luff attached to the mast with hoops, lacing, track with slides, but in a mast groove. And the triangular jib or overlapping headsail called a genoa is hanged to the wire for stay or held in a groove foil on the wire. The addition of a headsail increased the sail area so vessels could travel faster in light winds. Next slide, please. Combining an overlapping headsail with a mainsail also provided racing yachts with enhanced lift when beating to windward. The two sails operating in tandem produced more lift than if the sails were operating separately and their lift forces added together. Research has shown that it is the headsail that benefits from the presence of the mainsail with increased airflow speed around the luff and leeward side of this sail developing greater lift. The lift produced by the mainsail in tandem is in fact slightly reduced, with the airflow slowing initially as it enters the slot between the two sails and begins to pass over the leeward side of the mainsail. This enhanced performance by two sails in tandem is however very dependent on sail trim. Traditional vessels rigged with square sails may be able to sail as close as 50 or 60 degrees off the wind. Whereas modern ships, sorry, modern yachts can achieve between 30 and 40 degrees. As we have seen, when sailing, a sailing vessel attempts to sail directly to windward, it has to sail first on one tack, and then the helmsman turns the vessel's bow through the wind until the sail is set on the opposite tack. So the vessel sails a zigzag course until it reaches its destination. This change of tack maneuver is often referred to as going about. Next slide, please. This slide shows four boats on the left sailing on the port tack and about to, about to change tack while rounding the white marker buoy. The wind is blowing from the distant right-hand side of the photograph. The boat to the right has started to turn and is almost head to wind, with the jib flapping and the mainsail luff blowing back. The small boat which is leading has completed the turn, in other words, gone about, and is sailing on the starboard tack with their sail drawing and propelling the boat forward while sailed to port. On long keeled boats such as Orkney Yoles, the jib is sometimes backed when the bow is head to wind to help swing the boat's bow round when going about. Changing tack on boats with dipping lug sails is a more complicated process. The following procedure is used on the Ness Scoths of Lewis when going about. Next slide, please. After turning the boat's bow into the wind, the sail is partially lowered and the sail tack unhooked at the stem. The fore end of the yard is dipped behind the mast, as shown in the first slide, 
and the sail tack is re-secured to the hook on the new windward side of the stem. The yard and sail are then lowered completely on the opposite side of the mast as shown in the second slide. The yard is unhooked from the traveller and re-hooked after rotating the traveller to remove the halyard twist. The halyard tackle is transferred across the boat to the opposite gunnel, as is the sheet, as is the sheet attached to the lower aft corner of the sail before the sail is hoisted, sheeted in, and the boat sets off on the opposite tack. Next slide, please. In fine weather, going about takes a practice crew about a minute to complete on a scos. A simplified version of this procedure is carried out when changing tack with the small puppy lug boats. This next slide shows lug boats in the process of tacking. Next slide, please. To conclude, a brief mention of the high loadings that arise in sailing vessels, particularly when beating to windward. The 30-foot nest scos built in Lewis in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was used to fish for cod and ling in the Minch and near Atlantic, was rigged with a single mast and a large dipping lug sail. Next slide, please. To reduce wear over the sheave at the masthead, a wire halyard was fitted. Massive clamp timbers were bolted to the hull and thwarts each side to brace the open hull and to just, just distribute the loads from the halyard tackle, which was tied around the clamp. Besides holding up the sail, the halyard also acted as the shroud to support the rig. When sailing to windward in 15 knots of wind on these big scoths, a healing force of about 150 kilograms might arise, with a driving force of perhaps 40 to 50 kilograms. To support the mast and rig, the halyard, acting as a shroud, together with its attachment at the gunnel, had to sustain 350 kilograms, plus the load due to the weight of the yard and sail. Meantime, the mast step had to support about 430 kilograms bearing down on it. So while the wind may be a free source of energy, for a sailing vessel to convert this into forward thrust when beating to windward, involves high rig loadings and considerable structure to support the rig. As a closing remark, sailors might like to know that virtually the entire driving force produced by a boom mainsail when beating to windward acts through the gooseneck fitting where the main boom is attached to the mast. And that concludes this uh, presentation. Well, gentlemen, well, Dennis and Len, that was superb. I could listen to this talk for the same time again, no problem. It was lovely, Len, to see the, the cutty sack as your example, first example of a, of a clipper ship. Um, that was my first and only attempt to uh, put a ship in a bottle when I was but a lad. So it was wonderful to see that. Now, um, there's a lot of questions coming in. I'm hoping our technical bods can find a way of giving us a, a few extra minutes to uh, do these questions and, and comments justice. Um, Len, what was, the, what was the cargo capacity of clipper ships like the Cutty Sark in, in volume or ton tonnage? Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it. I don't have it to hand. I would guess it, it must... Hmm. I have read recently about the, the number of uh, uh, tea boxes that they carried, and it was thousands. Right. But uh, I cannot tell you in tonnage. Yeah, you mentioned earlier, of course, it was it was um, less than the you know the bulky ships, the, you know, with the the square sort of bow that you showed earlier on. Yeah, but just, the, the value of the cargo, especially if you could get there first and get the highest prices, that was that, that was the driving force, wasn't it? The, the tea was, of course, was packed in tea chests, and I'm, I'm sure I still have one lying in my shed. But uh, <laughs> uh, they were plywood and lined with lined with foil, of course, aluminium foil to keep the tea dry. Now, there were there were a few questions uh, and comments related to this this fact because um, some of the pictures you showed, you know, with the with the rough seas and of course that that um, artist's uh, painting, you know, with the full sail, the full rigged uh, boat in the rough water, and it was all about um, how stable how stable were these, especially the shallow draft ships in rough weather uh, related questions. You know, what was the loss rate of ships? What was the fatality rate of men on these ships? 
Well, it was, I can only tell you it was high. And well, I said to, of the five ships that set off in that, that particular race, four eventually succumbed at sea. And uh, around our coastline, there was tremendous loss. Every time there was bad weather, they were helpless. They had just to go where the wind blew them. And uh, in the North Sea, you eventually come to land somewhere, you know. It was, <laughs> it was, it was high. Yeah, yeah, it must have been. I mean, some of these, the picture, you know, with the four men on the on the mast, you know, and hanging on, as you say, with one hand. Um, it, it's not just, it would, it's not just wet, it would have been freezing cold with the wind up there in, in certain conditions as well. Yes, it's it's maybe significant too that uh, there was a, there was really was a court case at one time because there was a bit of a mutiny and the, the, the men were called before the court and one man was exonerated because he was considered he should not have been expected to climb a mast at the age of 40. 40. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, it, was a, it was a young man's job. Very young man. I mean, 40 doesn't seem that old to me, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> See, the, uh, in, in, in that, in that um, painting, how many square yards of sail did, did the aerial have in that, in that picture? Sorry, I don't have that. I, I should have researched all this That's before right. we started. Yeah. It, it, it was, well, you can see it, it's huge, absolutely huge. And of course, the, the slim ships were not, not quite so seaworthy as the fat ones, you know. So it did mean that, I think that's why so many did succumb eventually. And, and skippers, I suppose, too, some would be cautious. The cautious men would be all right, but some would carry too much sail sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not an engineer, but I'm sure Dennis can answer. It just, uh, it, it looks intuitively to me that, you know, the those thin, narrow speed boats, you know, the clippers, um, they looked a bit unstable if they had a lot of sail on them, you know, they just they just, they just felt to my, intuitively to me that they were unstable. I'm sure, Dennis, you could explain that with your phys your diagrams, your forces diagrams. You know, I think if, you, if they were running more or less before the wind, then the, the healing force is not large. But obviously, if, if, the, if, the, if the wind was more from the side on, then they would have to reduce sail um, because of the lack of... Well, they, they were fairly narrow hulls, but they were, they were quite deep. When they were, obviously, when they were laden, they were quite deep. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, the, the centre of gravity would have been reasonably low. Um, but they, but they were but they I think from memory the the cutty sack was about was about twelve hundred or fifteen hundred tons then in total? Uh, probably about that yes I think yeah mm. I mean they weren't big ships yeah, they had uh, they you know they painted them with the uh, artificial uh, gun ports along the side so it was all black and white and the the rule was they had this kind of uh, unofficial thing that it was one gun port for every thousand tons for for every hundred tons. Uh -huh. so, so of course, but uh, ship owners would exaggerate a little. They'd add a few more <laughs> guns. A, a, a bit of bragging. A bit of bragging. <laughs> it's like the fisherman. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That was. A, she's looking at all the all those sails and in, in, in those photographs. And Where was the sailcloth manufactured? I mean, it must have been. It must have been a huge industry or related industries in the eighteen hundreds to provide sailcloth for all the sailing ships. A huge industry, and I think especially down uh, sail making. I suppose it was all round the coast, but I, I know that there was a lot of it was done around the south of England, for, especially for the navy. I suppose there was uh, yeah. roperies for making about the rope, and uh, where they and you talk about the rope walk. You know, well that was where they had a long area where they could actually walk the rope and, and twist it as they went along. Yeah, of course. So the, the um, uh, were the crews were they all paid, well, you know, paid people, or were they pressed like the the, the Royal Navy sailors and things? All, all the all the merchantmen were uh, recruited and paid. Yeah, yeah that's good. Mm -hmm. Did did the and New even York the one... even the navy men, the press men were paid, of course. But uh, yeah, yeah, they just went yeah. there willingly. Yeah, I suppose <laughs> the navy men had uh, doctors, and you know, they had they had probably had better lives I suppose and some of the people on the land but see the newer clippers did they need larger or smaller crews than the earlier ships you know because you know the you were to, they kept increasing the mast increasing the sail I, th I think people? they would have need they would have needed uh, a larger crew yeah uh, just for 
Yeah, you imagine when they're having to uh, trim the, trim sails so or just sail, take sail off, put sail on. It's uh, and especially when they're doing things like wearing ship, every crewman had his job and had to be alert. Uh, it was a skilled operation, and it needed men to do it. Yeah, and I would imagine, you know, when they are racing to get the the tea or the spices to whatever destination first, it would have been a bit of a racing head some of them might have had on them, I would guess. <laughs> the, yes, and uh, I think, uh, well, I think when they were in the tea race, a lot of skippers spent most of their time on the poop deck, snatching a nap in a deck chair, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic stuff. See, to properly man these vessels, were there teams for each set of sails or, or how, how, how were they set up? I, I don't think it were. I really don't know, to tell you the truth. But I imagine they would have to each. Uh, there would be teams indeed, but each team would have to know every operation. Yeah, yeah. I right, so they could just go into another master or whatever. Yeah. Yes. I mean, if, think of, if there was a major sort of uh, increase in the wind speed in that, where they had to the reef sail. I mean, it was. It wasn't like I think everybody was called on deck basically. I think these ships, they required all the crew. And it was probably the bosun that was the main man that could, well, other than the master was, probably controlling the individual lines that were hauled. Yeah. Yeah. There was a question, that was a lovely scene in the modern clipper, I have to say. Um, it's, it's, it's still had the same cut, the same shape as the, uh, you know, like the cut he's had, but beautiful. I love the curve of a, of, of a clipper. But it was, yeah, you see it the was, light boats and everything on them, you know. It was, uh, and they used the sail. Every night we sailed, we went under sail. The only time they used the engine was getting back to get ready for the next trip. You know, so we had one, one night of engine, but uh, the rest of the time it was all sail. And it was, of course, it was so simple because it was uh, high tech. Yeah, so reading that, there was a question came in. How many people are needed to fully crew the Royal Clipper? And how does that compare with something like the Cutty Sap? Well, I think it'd be quite a high number, but most of them were catering staff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Aye, well, you'll obviously you in the lap of luxury there. Then, uh, then, uh, I suppose that there would have had to be some sort of reserve if there was a breakdown of the motor or the electric. <laughs> true. That's very true. Yeah. yeah. Well, they had the, the, obviously they had an auxiliary motor and, the, and they had... The, Bow thruster as well, but I watched particularly to make sure he wasn't using it when he did the tack. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of, sort of technical questions here. How much more manoeuvrable were the barges with steering sails? The barges were they were difficult as well, and but I, but I think they, they must have been easier because two men, a man and a boy, could do it. Yeah. So they must have been easier. But also, I did. I forgot to mention actually when when you're sailing, a, if you're tacking with an Orkney yawl, you use the same kind of uh, operation because the skipper grabs the hold of the grabs hold of the boom above his head and pushes it over towards the wind, and that encourages the stern to move round because they're notoriously difficult to steer through the wind as well. When I started first, I. Took me a long time. <laughs> it's simple when you know how, but it took a long time to find it's out. Like everything, there's a knack to it when you feel the momentum changing. And I, uh, it's, it's I did a lot of wearing right. ship before I found out how to do it. <laughs> I bet you did. There's, here's another another uh, sort of, um, technical question: Were the topsails on on a topsail schooner added mainly for speed, or was there other re reasons for adding them to the ship's design? Oh no, that was <clears throat> to get to get speed and propulsion. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it was for speed. Yeah. Yeah. And I've got one last question. Why did the concept of an outrigged stabilising hull leading to the catamaran and trimaran take so long to appear, you know, from like the Pacific Islanders? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we have a ponder, we have a ponder. <laughs> I suppose. I really don't. I don't know. I suppose uh, for again for cargo carrying, they weren't the ship, were they? These early ones, they were they were canoes mm -hmm. joined joined together with. Spar I'll show you what. 
It's interesting, you know, engineering-wise and culture-wise. Yeah, yeah. You, you go down a certain track. Oh, it's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. <laughs> yeah, you tend to go down a certain path, don't you, when you're and, and you get kind of caught in it. It takes a lateral mm. thinker sometimes to, to get out well, of it. Well, they, they did sometimes used to, you know, um, secure two boats together. If they were, <laughs> even in Orkney in the early 20th century, if they were taking a heavy like a tractor to some of the smaller islands in the North Isles. They did, um, so it's a form of catamaran, but uh, <laughs> as to why they did, it took so long to, to become accepted, when it's still not, not really accepted, no. the catamarans are not, well, they are becoming more and more accepted, but the you know, motor cat catamarans are still uh, resisted by you know, ferry companies. I mean, yeah. you know, they, 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 well, they, they cost more to build for a start. Yeah. Well, the first, one I, first and only one yeah. I've been on is the Pentolina. That was the, the, yeah. the first one I ever saw. Um, yeah. I've and got, they, have, uh, they have problems in a seaway. When they started them on, on the English Channel some, a lot of years ago now, but they had to take them off the western end of the channel because the crew were so seasick. Oof, right. And it was so they put them on the shorter journey at, at the east end of the channel. Uh -huh. uh, it is a violent... Uh, I, I actually, I uh, just come to think of it, I had a short trip on one uh, off the Australian coast. And uh, when it blew up one day and there's a bit of a sea going and uh, he couldn't go straight into it, he goes slightly off the sea so it should roll over it. And, and it was violent. Uh, uh, my wife Lily was sitting in her chair one minute and the next minute she was sitting on the deck just uh, a yeah. violent movement. Yeah, that's frightening stuff. Now, I said it was the last question, but there's a bit of a rush that's just coming in. I'm going to try and get through two or three of them. It's Claire Griffiths, in Shetland, a sixerine was a common fishing boat until the Gloop disaster in 1832, where 17 boats were lost. Was Orkney affected by this disaster? And did that lead to a change in their vessel design as in Shetland? I'm not aware of um, Orkney being particularly badly affected by that that particular storm. And there was no change that I'm aware of in 1832. Okay. Uh, fair enough. Apart from the tea races, were there any similar races in other parts with other cargoes? And are these races the inspiration for modern day tall ships races? There weren't any farmer races, but um, I guess skippers would often if they're headed for the same pot. Hey, you know what it's like. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll race you. <laughs> I'll race you. And then, of course, they carry too much sail, as we're all guilty of doing, carrying too much sail. There's actually a, a, a comment come in, in, in uh, Len, regarding, uh, I've looked up the sail area of the full rigging Sorlum dip based in Christian's Land, which visited Orkney when the tall ships came 10 years ago. It was 10,360 square feet. That's a fair amount. That, that, that's, that's a lot of canvas. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> Gentlemen, can I just thank you very much for this? And I'm going to close it there because we have uh, definitely run out of time now. I'd like to thank our audience for very actively participating and submitting their questions and comments. And of course, Len, and Dennis, thank you so much for that fascinating, enlightening and thought-provoking talk. I personally love sailing ships. I love their beauty. And you've improved my knowledge of how they work and how the wind is harnessed. It's been a real, real joy. So thank you both very, a, very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you can now join us for lunch at 12.45 p.m., we go over to Bursay and the Garden of the Old Manse, the home of the great Orkney naturalist, the Reverend George Lowe, where a plaque is going to be unveiled to him. If you're enjoying the festival, please consider donating. Full details of how to do so are below. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, and follow our YouTube channel. And remember, the Festival Club will be open this evening at half past nine. If it's half as good as it was yesterday evening, you will thoroughly enjoy it. 
Anyway, thank you all and goodbye for now.